I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Lone Star House of Design, a showcase of divine design from the great state of Texas, featuring Allison Jaffe, an Austin designer whose cerebral approach to design is nothing short of genius. <laughs> We talk about the psychology of design quite often on the podcast because it isn't easy to understand what someone really wants the design to feel like. Allison didn't start out as a designer. To the contrary, she started by pursuing the sciences, specifically a degree in neuropsychology from the University of Pittsburgh. You're going to hear how Allison modified her pursuit from the scientific to the creative and use her education to drill down with clients to reach their subconscious desires as it relates to the manner in which they wish to live. Sigmund Freud said, the mind is like an iceberg. It floats with one seventh of its bulk above the water. To me, this is one of the true assets of interior designers. The truly talented ones have different means and methods for discovering what the client's true desire is. We all know clients that have said one thing only later to discover that they meant something entirely different. We're going to drill down on that. Speaking of discovering true desires, you have needs too. Find some inspiration and new perspectives you can see in real time how the industry is changing so quickly. To aid you with that, please make sure you're subscribing to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode of Convo by Design, Lone Star House of Design, or some really exciting and entertaining new shows coming your way later this year. You can find the show everywhere you find your favorite podcasts, and now you can find Convo by Design and other design and architecture podcasts at designnetwork.org. For designers, this has been like the beginning of of the golden age. This is like a renaissance of interior design. How has your business been affected by this? So I can't stress how grateful I've been. I, I'm, I'm just processing this. This whole year for me was just a, a blip, but in a way, a really good blip because I just I just really focused on, on myself and staying in my own lane. And um, I'm, a, I'm an introvert by nature. So being at home (laughs) was okay with me. Um, This year for, for, for my business has been the best year. 2020 was the best year in business. Um, I was able to capture some great projects, uh, continue the ones that were still happening from 2019. And, um, you know, they, it's funny how everyone said, oh, everyone's going to be at home, um, you know, calling you because now's the time. Honestly, no one, no one ever said that, those, those words to me. Um, it wasn't, it's like they'd been planning it, but it wasn't like the, the, the circumstances weren't the catalyst to why they were starting their project. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. No, that's really interesting. I'm just curious. So between, so you were completing the projects that you had or that you already had in, in the queue, but as far as the new business, it, where did that come from? And did it come for you all at once or was, you know, was it a tidal wave or was it a slow trickle? It, for me, it, it was like in these, in these groupings that it came but it was not because of outside circumstances. That's the one thing about why I absolutely love running a business because it's really an internal aspect. It's what I'm, what I'm working on in the inside gets projected to the outside. So if I was working on sales in the aspect of my business, if I was working on tightening up my processes, it was a reflection from inside to outside. Um, so I don't, I don't feel personally that it was any external, you know, causation. It was really what I was working towards that had me generate the continuation of business throughout the year. You put it out there and it came back to you. Oh, no, I were, I mean, like <laughs> yeah, I did the work, but when I say work, it doesn't have a disempowering context. It's like, Got I did it. the work that was fun, yeah. uh, working on myself. I, Oh, I took up a challenge of reading books um, prior to us going into lockdown. Um, and so, I, funny enough, my computer's sitting on the books that I was reading. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Yeah. Well, just just out of curiosity, what was the subject matter? Was it was it biographical? Was it self help? Was it business? I mean, what was the? Was it all over? It was it was completely business. I mean, there there are ah, always okay. things that like a, a a business owner like I'm always wanting to fine tune or sharpen, um, kind of put the bow on some gaps. We all have gaps that we're that we're working on. Um, uh, and, and that kind of leads to like why I absolutely love being a designer and, and the, and the running the business aspect of it. Cause I love, uh, like learning what it is. I don't know. I don't know. And transforming those areas. Right. Well, for you, what were the gaps? The gaps were really, uh, around, um, you know, in sales, no one's born a natural salesman, saleswoman, mm-hmm. salesperson. Um, the gaps for me were when someone presented a, uh, I'm blanking on the word, an objection. They were all, they were all objections and not knowing how to handle those objections because in the world of sales, if, if you're unable to kind of guide that potential client through their objections, then, you know, it's either a sales win or a sales loss. That is so true. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, what did what did you learn from that? Did you did you adjust the the manner in which your self confidence comes out in answering specific questions? Did you um, did do you now focus more on having background and supporting information? I'm asking because this comes up a lot, and it's really interesting to me because as a designer, you know, you decided that you wanted to enter into a creative field. And I have found that those who enter into really the creative side of the business do not enjoy the sales side of the business because it's not fun. It's not fun going out and selling yourself over and over again and selling your value over and over again and determining, and it ties in with the business side of it, right? Like how much do you charge and what is your business model? How did that change you from the standpoint of how you do business? Yeah. Well, just to, to back up, I started started my business in 2010. And so for the past year, I feel that I've been baking this cake in confidence and learning my own value. And, uh, you know, in this past year, actually really within the past month, six weeks before, before you know, 2020 wrapped up, I really put the decorations on the cake and, and really got clear on on what it looks like to, to be that business owner um, who innate has, you know, for, for a good designer, the design comes innate. I mean, it's just like built in, um, you know, how, how we put it together is just how a, a CPA is able to just crunch numbers. They just get numbers. I just, you know, for me, I just get, you know, space planning. I get how, how kitchen functions, I get, you know, how do fabrics match up with each other? Um, uh, I kind of lost track of what your original question was, but um, yeah, kind of the, the, the key takeaways that uh, I, I garnered from the work that it in kind of learning these like sales techniques is um, to, you know, to really guide the conversation, to have a listening for as to what the client is really struggling with. Um, and then, you know, a little key tip that I learned that's been really transformative, just a small little tweak, is I never leave a phone call without setting up another phone call. Mm-hmm. So if I'm, I'm first talking to that potential client to, if I've gone over to their house and we're walking through their project for the first time, I'm always setting it up for when are we going to speak next so that I can continue to create that safety and certainty with them so that they know that they've got, you know, it's like we, we've just set up our next date. Like it always feels good. <laughs> it does. And it's really interesting too, because that's one of the things that I find is missing is sort of the establishment of a traditional sales pipeline, right? And if, when you have a pipeline, you put it in the funnel and you're, you're trying to move it from the top down to the bottom. And I think that that gets lost oftentimes, especially um, through the process of, of the work. 
generally speaking, um, many designers that I've that I've spoken to, uh, architects tend to do this a little bit better. And I think because their time frame, their timeline is so much longer. Um, but designers will just sort of like pack the pipeline early, get into a lot of projects and then kind of ignore what comes next while they're working on the projects. And then they get to a point where there's kind of like that panic moment, right? Where it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have enough work scheduled in the future. So what you're talking about, where you're sort of moving, you're managing your pipeline a little bit. I think it's of critical importance. What's interesting to me too is, that's not something that's taught in interior design school. No. They'll teach, you, they'll teach you history. Yeah. You know, you'll learn a lot about history, which by the way, can we just talk about that for one second? Because you're a designer, I'm not. Uh, I would be if I had the talent, but I don't. And I realize that, so I'm not. But what's interesting to me is I, I understand the need to understand this the business and from from where it came and where it started but i don't under, i don't understand the the majority of the the history that's put into interior design education i just don't feel like it it, it resonates with where the career will take you once you start working i i mean can you say that for a lot of you know school you know when you when you go get the degree yes. it sets the foundation for you know, for, for me learning how to do AutoCAD or for me to understand like the fundamental of designs, but it is much like a lot of degrees where you don't actually get to establish what it looks like in the real world until you're actually like moving through the real world and getting on your hands-on experience and fumbling your way through, you know, all those different areas that were, were unexpected. I mean, it's, it's just like life. (laughs) You just, yeah. yeah. Um, but what I do brings me so much joy so that every time I do hit those like stumbling block blocks, I, I set a, set a little uh, note to myself saying how grateful I am. Cause it's, it's really, I mean, every time I stumble, it's like leverage me to the next, to the next plateau no, or not plateau to the next level. And then, you know, no, you kind it- of plateau and then move up again. Yeah, no, I get it because there is no such thing as a as a direct upward trajectory, right? There is always a, a, a plateau. There is always coming back. And I think it's interesting though, uh, the fact that you started your business at the really at the tail end of of the last major disaster prior to, to 2020, right? So you had you go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. I am so actually thankful I did. So when I was starting my business, you're right, it was the tail end of the recession. And it was something my grandfather said to me that I will always hold near and dear. He said there and he was a business owner himself. He said, there's no better time to start a business than in a down market, because you have nowhere else to go but up. And, and so it really set me for a a, a, an upwards trajectory, because I'm just starting with nothing when everyone else was starting (laughs) kind of in the same space I was. But I also had in the back of my mind, you know, okay, I'm starting with nothing and I'm building something. If I, if, if this happens again, my question that I kept on asking myself is, will I be able to ride whatever is thrown at me? So, and, 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 and that's what I think had me have the success I did this year is because this ability to adapt and pivot is key. I mean, just to, to learning to go with the flow and like I said, stay in your own lane and, f- and focus on the things that feel good. You know, that like reading the book felt good. Taking this little sales course I did felt good. Trying to like weed out what isn't working, like taking inventory of like, all right, I've tried this in business or I've tried this in design and, and my, my uh, structures, like where can I tweak it where what doesn't feel good is pushed out of the way. Interesting too, that you have a, I, I believe you have a degree, you certainly studied neuropsychology, right? From, from University of Pittsburgh, is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Explain to me 
how you go from neuropsychology, and by the way, it fully explains sort of like this this thirst for knowledge and this quest for 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 learning that you went through in this time. And I I sort of equate that to not that like I'm trying to read the tea leaves here, but you seem to me like the kind of person who wants to have answers. And it doesn't mean necessarily that, am I reading your mail a little bit? Okay. Sorry, <laughs> but you, you want to have answers for this. It doesn't mean that you have to perfect it. It doesn't mean that you have to succeed at everything you do, but you kind of want to understand the fundamental roadmap so that you can drive without banging into every tree and rock and stone in the road. No, actually, um, I, I am, I am, uh, there's something that I, that I do a little, I, I dabble in different modalities. I, I don't have to go. If anyone wants to look up human design, that's something that I'm very interested in, but they categorize, you know, my, my profile type as a three, five. And, and what that, that means is that I am meant to experiment over and over and over again until I figure it out. And then to actually share that with the world. So that's why I absolutely love taking on clients who have never worked with a designer. I, I love guiding them or even in my personal life, if I, if I have an aha, you know, I want to be able to share so that you, you don't have to make the same mistakes I do. And I'm very comfortable making those, you know, getting up, doing it again. Like it, it's, it's, it, um, it's, it's part of the DNA <laughs> that I was given. I, so it's, I feel, I feel like you and I are probably similar in this regard. Like you don't mind making mistakes. You just don't want to make the same mistakes twice. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting to me too, that you follow along this neuropsychology path. You, you actually found the perfect career. You really did. And because early- what, too. Yeah, yeah. And what most people don't realize is there is such a large amount of psychology that that goes with the, the design process. Many people, you know, it's really interesting people who and I think you probably find this is that people who don't work, or haven't worked with a designer in the past, really don't understand the process that they're about to put themselves through. It's like therapy. It's not it's not necessarily a fun process, where you get to just say, okay, I want that. And I want that. And here's my favorite color show me what you got. It's not reality TV. It's not how this works. You know, you have to really, and that's why I kind of, I get what you're saying, where you enjoy working with clients who have never worked with a designer before, because it's not necessarily a, a fun and happy experience to start. It's like therapy. It's, it's hard when you get started, when you, when you have to kind of look within yourself and realize, okay, here's what I want. Sometimes the hardest question to answer is what we actually want, isn't it? it you are, are speaking to this email. So I just signed on this on this client and she, she wrote to me, she says, um, I hope you can bear with my indecisiveness. And I'm, I'm about to write her, her back. And, and I said, it's absolutely okay because the reason you've been so indecisive is because you don't have the confidence or the know-how, but... I get to take that on. I get to, one of the aspects, one of the psychological aspects is, is not only intuitively designing, you know, feeling it out. I have to, I have to interpret their vision, but also in embedding confidence into them, knowing that through me, they're using my eyes, my abilities to, to see out their project, but to actually really usher in a, a world of confidence that they've never had in, in a space that you're, like you said, you know, designing for someone who's never done it is, is a real puzzle piece. Um, but that's one of my favorite aspects is I love it when a client gains the confidence to be able to have a conversation, for example, with a contractor that they, I know that they wouldn't be able to have beforehand or that towards the end of the project, my involvement becomes, comes smaller and smaller because I know that I've, I've given the confidence to them or I don't get offended if, if a client takes ownership of the project because it's not my home. So, so for, for someone to say, look what I did, like, yes, you did that because you're just using me to hold the space. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a vessel for, for me to interpret what it is you want and then put it from a 2D world into a 3D world. You're a facilitator. 
facilitator, implementer, supporter. Yeah, uh, but, at, but at the same time, I don't want you to ignore the other sides of that too, which obviously the creative side, that has to be yeah. there first. That being said, I'm curious, has, has 2020, um, has it changed the way you do business? Did it change your contracts? Did it change your business model? Did it change your pricing? Did it change uh, anything about how you structured the business? It, it didn't change the way I structured because I'm still out there meeting with clients just as I would. I do have that ability to, to meet online, but people still crave that interaction. And so, you know, we're, we're just responsible with, with wearing our masks. Um, I didn't take any business online. No, it didn't, it didn't change in the fact that I got closer to my value. And so, yes, it did increase you know, are my, you know, investment and services, if anything. So back into that a little bit, um, your, your business model, is it, is it hourly? Is it retainer? Is it, is it plus margin? Um, and, and the structure you have now, has that changed over time? Yeah. Um, so I started out uh, as most do hourly you know, and it, it's gradually increased. And then I was introduced to what's called a hybrid model. And uh, uh, so a hybrid model is a mix of flat rate and hourly. Um, and I tried that on. And then I second guessed myself <laughs> and went back to <laughs> hourly and then realized I was shooting myself in the foot and, and, uh, came to the conclusion that this hybrid model, which is a mix of flat fee and hourly is such a strong model. Um, uh, and I know that when you get into a certain clientele, they don't wanna, they don't wanna be invoiced a bunch of times. Um, so, so it did take an iteration actually during, during 2020. So now it is a mix of flat rate and retainer, like a monthly retainer. Do you also work in a margin component to that? And I'm curious if you're finding, because, because you do so, so many kitchens and baths, because you work with so many different vendors, I'm curious if you're finding um, there are more opportunities. And the reason I ask is because over the past few years, especially with the proliferation of um, internet shopping, the fact that every designer is shopped by their clients uh, on a regular basis, it kind of squeeze the margin a little bit and what what the income and earning potential is of of designers. I'm curious if you if you have a, adjusted for that, if you work on um, using those margins as uh, a, a a core element to the bottom line. so I, I shook my head in, in the middle of that because I don't have client shopping me because I set the expectations up front. You know, when we're doing furnishings, I let them know that I, I, you know, will, will purchase through my trade, but those, I give them analogies so that they can wrap their head. So for example, uh, I share with them the analogy of the reason I shop with the trade vendors is because I don't want you showing up. Like uh, if you're going to your friend's house for your, for a, for a cocktail hour, hour, I don't want you to show up in the same little black dress that your friend does. That means you guys both went to the same crate and barrel and picked out the same sofa. Whereas, you know, shopping with me, the advantage is that you get access to hundreds of thousands of different vendors that you don't necessarily know about. Um, so also setting it up when I'm, when I'm working on a remodel project that all the purchasing is, is done by me. Um, so we set that up at the front. Um, and then the, uh, another component is, um, in the event that I, it, it, in, it's in my agreement, in the event that I show them something and then they go shop me. I do have a 20% fee that I put on top of it for shopping me. So, so having that little blurb in there prevents those little sneaky potential clients. But at the same token, I really haven't encountered that. Um, you know, I've worked, I've, I've done a lot of work on who I attract the, the type of, the type of, of 
personality, the type of core being that my clients are that I want to want to associate that they're not they're not there to go like they're too busy to go shopping. <laughs> you know, they see the value in what the designer is bringing to the table and they honor that from day one. That makes sense. When did you move from uh, Pennsylvania to Texas? And did you go directly to Austin? And if so, why? <laughs> I didn't. I'm from Austin. Oh, you're from Austin. So I, I went from Austin to, and I just went to Pitt, University of Pittsburgh for school. And then I came back to Austin, okay. um, did a year interim, and then immediately went back into school for uh, my second degree, which is interior design. Okay. So tell, okay. So you're from Austin, which is, which is great. It's always good to get a native and, and a native's perspective, right? I lived in Dallas for nine years. I, I, I started Convo by Design well in advance of starting Lone Star House of Design. One of the things that I noticed, and which is why I started it, is when it comes to design, Texas is, is, is really kind of like a flyover state. Um, there's not a lot of recognition of designers um, or architects, yet there's amazing design and architecture. You don't find many AD 100 creatives from the great state of Texas. And I kind of wanted to explore the work that's being done a little bit more. And, and what's interesting, what I found is there's great design education in place. You have remarkable resources, uh, Round Top for one, you've got great design cities, Austin, Houston, Dallas. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective as why you think, why is Texas such a flyover state as it relates to design and architecture? I, I mean, you take anything that happens on the East and West Coast, it's always coming together. I don't know the why, I, I haven't explored that myself, but I think companies, uh, and I can give a perfect example, are waking up to how important Texas is in the realm of design uh, and architecture. I mean, I, I, I'm just in awe of some of the, some of the, the designers and architects that are, that are putting out work. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I, Monogram, for example, is a appliance company predominantly seen in the Northeast I had never really heard about it until they called me one day and said, hey, uh, we noticed that you just spec some, uh, some appliances out of our suite from our, our monogram package. Would you like to be on our design council? <laughs> I was like, I don't know who you guys are. <laughs> well, and, and they're like, look, we're trying, to, we're trying to build a market in Texas because we're starting to see that we're missing out on core opportunities uh, in this region. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, it's, it's, they're waking up, you know, uh, whether it's publications or vendors that are selling products, uh, it's just a slow bill, just like anything else coming from the outside in and, and, uh, you know, the coasts being raining, raining the direction of, of where the country goes, you know, so. So tell me about Austin in particular, as it relates to a design climate. Um, one of the things that I think is, is really interesting about Austin, I love this, is that, you know, it's a progressive city with one foot firmly planted in the past. And when it comes to the type of architecture that you see downtown Austin, they've made extraordinary steps. They've taken extraordinary steps to save a lot of things uh, so that you get really this, this diverse complex tableau of old, new, important, and experimental. So I'm curious how that sort of affected the, the design ethos and how you work within that. Do you, do, you in, do, your, do you find your clients to be somewhat adventurous and experimental? Do you think that Austin is a, 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 an experimental and adventurous design community? 
there's how I design and then potentially how others personally, I am, I am not going to be that, you know, high trend setting a designer. That's just not where I, I, I want to be like, I, I want to map my brand as having real like longevity in design. Honestly, I'm kind of bored with what's happening in Austin. Really? Oh yeah. I mean, it is starting to become the, the same, uh, any pocket you go into, it's the same designs being produced over and over again. And I can't, I can't really tell what's, what's driving it, whether it's, you know, the investors, whether it's the, the builders, the architects, um, I personally, I'm, I'm going to have to like go the other direction. I'm, I, I'm, I'm bored with, with, you know, what's being produced in Austin, but you know, take it what you will on myself, the way I design. <laughs> okay. Cause you know, again, I'm, I'm not um, going back to the, my philosophy of designing is I'm holding the space for the client. I'm not, you know, you're going to get part of me in the design, but it's not for me to come up with the ideas. I want to leverage their ideas. Um, that really fuels me um, that I get to put it together to, for them. I get to make, have it make sense. One room, talk to another room. Okay. I get that. That's, and that's, and that's fair with that, you know, I let's transition a little bit um, to some of your work. Let's start in the kitchen. Let's start in the kitchen where you are right now. That's Viamonte. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah. So, so tell me about this. Was it, was it a, to the studs? Was it a remodel refresh? What new build? What was this? Yeah, it was a, it was a remodel South Austin. Um, your standard brick home, uh, with a peninsula Island and, a lot of that came from removing the island to open up the the kitchen itself. So it was a full gut in a sense. Um, fortunately, there weren't any structural remodifications that we had to do. Um, but along with recreating the island and, and organizing some better storage, uh, creating a larger pantry area, I was able to, to come up with this. Love the window, love the backsplash. You love the um, window? <laughs> the window was I, something that we couldn't, it, it was existing, had to work with it. Well, I, I, I really do love it. Um, and I love it for a couple of reasons. First of all, you sort of incorporated the lighting, you know, that, that, that circular shape through the lighting. Um, I also, I love the way that that window is where you still get all the light. You still get, um, it, it doesn't take away. You still get the countertop, you, but you still have privacy. Right, and you you sort of ran the the backsplash all the way all the way through the whole wall, um, and I and I like that. I know that it's monochromatic, but you know it's it's it. I think it's I think it. You really kind of nailed it. Um, and what I also love too is the functionality of the space, the amount of storage, the amount of seating. Um, you have some windows on the other side to play off of. Um, you you also got a little playful with with the art, um, and I'm curious, sort of, what motivated you, and sort of what what the impetus was, the inspiration behind this space. I had to photograph it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it shouldn't be any secret that the way that the client lives day to day is not the way that you know I, I'm going to make that space look so you know crave worthy. <laughs> right. So I, I had to stage it for the, for the project. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, putting together a, um, uh, a story for your photo shoots. Tell me about that. Tell me about the storytelling part. Um, you know, because the, the, you know, architecture is the language of design. Design is the storytelling. And I'm, I'm curious when it comes to storytelling, um, do you tell, do you, do you get complex with your stories? Do you, do you sort of, and you don't, you don't. <laughs> no. Headlines no, only. I don't even know if I've, uh, I mean, we're happy to explore that with you. Um, but I don't think initially like saying, oh, well, what's the storytelling? Again, if anything, it's such an intuitive way of storytelling. It's not a, it's not a, a verbal way. 
I get that. I get that. And I, I love too that, you know, I wanted to really focus. I love the interior design, but I wanted to kind of focus on two areas, um, the kitchens and the bathrooms. Um, cause I love them. And that's what originally, so I was like, wow, especially one of the bathrooms we're going to get to in a little bit. Um, Camwood though, uh, this kitchen from a color palette, I just, I found it amazing. I love that color palette. Um, tell me about this kitchen. Yeah. So that, that interestingly enough, those two kitchens are pretty much the same setup, just different size. It had a peninsula where it was attached to a wall. We did have to do some structural manipulation to the beam above so that we could, we could open it up a little more. Um, but if you can see, it's the same, it's the same kind of same setup. Um, this one was more cosmetic in the sense that I really wasn't moving around any appliances, the appliances, the, the sink, the refrigerator and the cooktop really stayed around the same, same. We, we moved the cooktop a little, a little bit to create some additional storage on the opposite end of the sink. But for, for the color that you, that you spoke to, um, again, it was, it was a, a request by the client that they wanted a blue island. And I really think that this was, this was one of the first blue islands because now if you look at Instagram, blue islands are everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's taken off, but uh, I'd like to say that, you know, this, this happened, this project is about two years old, uh, a year and a half. I, I'm not really sure somewhere. I feel like 2020, I feel like 2019 was just last year. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we kind of like, we leapfrogged 2020. Yep. Let's, just, let's yep. just forget that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It's so true, isn't it? Uh, I kind of want to, speaking of leapfrogging, go from the kitchen to the bathroom. And the original, the, when I saw this bathroom, and I think I mentioned it uh, in an email or something to you. Um, but when I saw this bathroom, it just sort of stopped me. Because you talk about you talk about playful, you talk about not necessarily experimental, but there's a there's just so much texture, nuance, and detail to Milky Way. I love, love, love that bathroom. To me, if a well-designed bathroom is one that you can look at and you can say, you know what, this is a space, this is a room. This isn't necessarily a, 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 just a functional bathroom, but it's a place where you'd actually want to spend a lot of time. It's spa-like, um, just the way that it was put together. And I, I kind of want to do a deep dive on this one because I absolutely love it. Everything from the tones and the color palette to the textures in the wood and the carpet, to the art, to the lighting. I mean, you you absolutely nailed the lighting. And then that shower. That shower is absolutely amazing. Um, and it's funny too, because one of the things that I, I have always wanted, and eventually I will find the time to actually get this done, is to have a steam shower. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you've got the steam shower with windows inside, I mean, that was probably a function of how the house was built originally, or maybe you put those in, but tell me about this bathroom. Yeah. So this is a project that came to me. Uh, the owner came to me, came to me. He already had the plans done by an architect. Typically I do both the plans and the finish out. Um, I happen to know this architect. So uh, I really trusted with where she designed everything. And, and I would have, I would have 100% probably designed it exactly the way she did, but I got to put on the finish out. What took me by surprise was what came out of and how I describe it is this modern organic. Like I, I, I never, I don't feel like I, I put something together like this. Um, now the homeowner himself was a, was a bachelor, but he was designing it for the intent of a possible, you know, future partner. Um, and so I had to keep in, in the mind, you know, creating storage, creating a place for that additional person. So it didn't, it didn't skew too far to the masculine. So I had to balance the two like masculine and feminine. Um, 
but again, he did, he, he's the one, you know, he has the, the Toto toilet, the fancy Toto toilet that I showed to him. And then later he said, no. And then later on, he's like, all right, I'm getting that toilet. Or um, he's the one who, who wanted that, the steam shower. And um, I, like I said, I wanted to have that double, double function uh, with the rain, you know, the, the two rain heads. Um, speaking to the, to the windows, they're existing. It's where the bathtub used to sit. So we just converted from, from where the, if you, oh, I don't like to show the before photos, but if you had any idea of this like tacky Tuscan mess that was there before, that's so, that everyone's wanting to like get out of their face in, in Texas. Like they're just, they're, you know, it's, it's the, we're wiping the slate clean of ticky taxi, ticky tacky Texas Tuscan is what I like to call it. <laughs> Say that three times. No, but it's funny too, because you look at it and you say, okay, this was obviously cr crafted, crafted. It was built between mid eighties and early nineties. No, so no, this is like a two thousands build. That's, that is like the two, early two thousands is like the height of Italian. Of uh -huh. Oh, is that right? Okay. Then, yeah. You know, it's funny. Then I just, it's funny too, because that kind of tilts my, um, the timing of this whole thing. Cause like here in Southern California, mid eighties to early nineties was that whole Tuscan Mediterranean kind of, kind of thing. And then in, in the early nineties, it's almost like people woke up and said, wait a minute. It's, it's like they woke up in the eighties from the seventies and thought, Whoa, what did we just do? And you look at the architect. I totally get, I totally get that. Oh um, yeah. The travertine, the, the browns and the golds. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting enough, though, what you what you've done here in this space, and, and I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Uh, if you can send me the photography for this space after, uh, I would love to put it up on Instagram and and showcase this because I I really do think it's great. There's just all of the detail work, the the way that the lighting, the way that you work the lighting, you know, just sort of going around this. So you have a window between the two sinks. And you you went with the eye level side lighting against each mirror while having both a center window as well as a window off to the right. Because you know what? If you didn't have that, if you had gone with another method of, of lighting, if you'd gone overhead, you you'd get completely washed out when you're looking into the mirror. I just I, I love the way that you obviously thought through this um, and the countertops and then and that sh the tile in particular, and sorry, but when I always ask who you specify, it's like, wait a minute, I do dozens of jobs. I don't know who I specified on everything, but I'm curious if you know who you specified and what you specified where. Uh, I would have to go back and I keep all, I keep track of everything. I can always, I can always share what tile that is. Um, but given that I had, we had to keep that center window. Uh, I really wanted to take advantage of the height of the of the vanity and really explore that and that's why I kept any everything linear from the mirror to to the lights and then to balance it out that's why we have such a a wide low you know uh, vessel type sink um, vessels aren't something I I particularly like to do unless it's really interesting like this where it was it was made out of concrete form um, and really again lends itself to that modern organic. But you also mirrored that in the tile on the wall. So you've got you've got this vertical feel with the windows and the mirrors and the lighting. And then you took a horizontal approach to, to counterbalance that with the low and wide tile as well as the sink, as well as the countertop. I thought that was I thought that was really brilliant. Um, into the shower, you know, this juxtaposition of this this off-white tile with with really dark fixtures. Um, I, I love that feel because it is masculine, but it's not exclusively masculine. And I love that. Um, do, you, do you remember who you specified for the steam or was that selected before you got? That's something I, I have the contractor do. It's just not yeah. in, in something that I, I'm like, you want a steam shower? I know just the person to talk to. Um, I mean, I, again, I probably have in my notes, like who, who specifically that was. Um, 
but kind of it, touching a little more again, you know, have this, I, I can't, when I design, there's that, that need to always have things talk to each other. So while it might not be a conscious decision when I'm designing, it's definitely kind of running in the background of, of current when I'm, when I'm guiding my clients through selections and whatnot. And just a question too. Um, I hear this a lot. And so I'm, I'm curious, especially because you're a, you're a self-improver, you're a, you're a self-learner, right? When it comes to, you know, like we talk about the steam shower and saying, you know what, I'm going to hand that off to the contractor. So I get that. I, I absolutely do get that. At the same time, because I hear that a lot from designers, it's like, look, you know what, when it comes to something like that or certain areas, I'm going to hand those things off to the contractor because I know that they can do it. I know that they can do it. What I also wonder is I see that as an opportunity missed from a designer because is it not true that everything that you touch and everything that you take control of and bring into your own ecosystem and and have control of from beginning to end, you, you get to price cost out control accordingly. Do you think um, in this new educational phase in which you find yourself that you'll be reaching out more to maybe control other areas that you haven't in the past, or do you know yourself enough to say, you know what, if I try to do that, it'll cost me elsewhere. It's, it's, it's the latter, you know, having, having been a designer for almost 15 years, running the company for 11. I, I even share this with clients. I have to know a little, a little about a, a little, a little bit about everything. So do I really want to incorporate and have the bandwidth to know and, to, to be in charge of specify, specifying a steam shower? Or do I just know that I'd rather focus on this? This sets me apart. I pretty much manage all my countertop installations. I mean, I've done full, you know, 5,000 square feet of countertop install to, you know, just the bathroom. So I, I would rather take that on or take on, you know, managing cabinet construction in the sense of like bringing in the cabinet maker. Uh, Choosing a, a, a recessed can or, or the, the steam shower or specifying some things, I just, I just know it's just not where my interest lies. Um, so that kind of speaks to what you're, you know, why I don't, I don't find it a loss to, to say the contractor is going to be installing that thing. I'll just let him handle that. I do know a little bit about, you know, the pitch of there has to be a pitch to the ceiling you know, kind of, kind of a little bits and pieces about installing it, but I don't want to, I, I, maybe it just doesn't interest me. <laughs> no. And I, I, you know, listen, I think that that's part of it. I think being able to, to know what interests you, capturing every opportunity that you want to, and then maybe walking away from things that aren't of interest to you and kind of staying with the things that inspire you knowing full well that if somebody wants something, maybe with that, you want to, you want to do way more steam showers, but you still don't want to be fully in, in involved in that for what it takes. So no, I think it's knowing, knowing yourself really is one of those things that, that makes great designers who you are, you know, because you don't try to take over too much. And let's be honest, when, when a mistake is made, it's your responsibility. And so, you know, trying to stay within the things that you feel comfortable with and not venturing too far out, but knowing that you can still do anything because you have good traits, you know, for you, I think it's fascinating. Taking on the counters is one of those things that I think is just, wow. Um, You know, you must have a very good relationship with some fabricators and knowing that you love that uh, is great. Do you find yourself specifying um, the same brands? Are there brands that you just absolutely love that you keep going back to, or do you keep trying to find new ones? Uh, you know, if someone introduces me to something and it's got the color palette, um, you know, whether it's, it's my fabricator who has their own in-house line where I can save my clients some money to, 
you know, if, if they fall in love with something, you know, from a, from a name brand, uh, uh material. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm different in the sense that I've always been the one to purchase and supply materials. I know there's a lot of designers who are hesitant, for example, they, they're so skittish about plumbing, you know, they, they, they think that it's gonna gonna bite them. But I, I've had where, you know, we can track back, we can identify exactly, oh, is it on my end or is it in the, on the installer? And more than right. likely it's, you know, you're, you're just, it's no different than, again, buying something at retail, getting it installed. You're not gonna go back to the retailer and say, you know, I have a problem with this stick that I bought. <laughs> <laughs> that they, someone else installed wrong. Um, but I've, I've had it where, yes, it was installed wrong or something was, was wrong. I call up the rep, I get them out there and we kind of, we kind of work towards a, a resolution or, or where we need to, to resolve whatever issue is happening. Um, last project I want to ask you about, uh, because for me, and it's funny too, because in, in Texas, I don't often in, encounter this, um, I love small spaces. I, I love, I feel like when a designer has a big space and a huge budget, it's not, it's not that it diminishes their skills. I just don't think it tests you. Um, I think there's a lot of things that you can do. And so you, when you have a small space, I feel like it really tests the designer. You get to really see, you know, how they are, how they, how they earn their uh you know their accolades and is it is it via media mm -hmm. is that the one um the 2014 asid legacy of design well i, I know via me via media yeah media okay yeah. so that that kitchen uh -huh. um i love i love the kitchen because it is not a big kitchen at all um but it feels like everything has its place and, th and that's, I, I just, one of my favorite things is, is space planning. I, I absolutely love uh, the idea of building out more storage or, you know, grouping things together in the way that my mind makes sense, <laughs> makes sense of it all. Um, so that, I mean, that's, you know, the tile and the, and the flooring and the, and uh, the countertops are all the, they're just the bells and whistles and, and the, again, the decorations where like the real, the real test of a designer is being able to, to space plan something and to, you know, again, have that function be the driving force. And what, what I love too about that kitchen is, um, you know, between the black cabinetry and the amount of storage that you worked into this, but also things that you did, like putting certain appliances under counter, um, gave such an abundance of, of counter space, making use of, of the window in this narrow galley-like kitchen. Um, do you know what I mean, though, where there are certain things that designers do in, sm in small spaces that not only maximizes the amount of functional space, but also allows the eye to sort of wander all over the place a little bit. And I feel like that's what you did in this one. Yeah, so that was the first time that I'd ever used, uh, like a, 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 in the island, the, the homeowner was such an avid baker. Um, and I was introduced for the first time of an appliance lift, like I'd never used one before. So I got to, to put the KitchenAid on this appliance lift so that you're not having to haul around this incredibly heavy piece of equipment. Um, and uh, uh, and I also started. That's when I started using the pull-out pantry doors. It's kind of my signature. Ah, okay. I, I've got certain little things that I use in every kitchen. Um, that like, oh, that's an Allison. That's an Allison kitchen. Um, and and those pull-out pantry drawers are are a signature of mine. I, I love that, and I and I love this space too. And, and again, you know, because I'm a fan of small space, you did something with this that I absolutely love. There is a doorway, there's, a, there's an entryway, an entryway into 
the kitchen itself, which is not wide. It looks like it's from a living space into the kitchen itself. The island was was basically, it looks to me, unless my angle's completely off, I don't think it is though. The island was placed in the middle of the entryway, which in theory, if you looked at it two-dimensionally, could create uh, uh, movement issues, right? But it doesn't. Um, you address the lighting, you actually put the lighting up in, you know, in the frame itself, and then you have seating, but it doesn't look like it conflicts. And it also creates an entire living space or communication space with, with the baker, the chef, whoever's doing the cooking and everybody else. It doesn't close them out. It's not completely open, but it is completely functional. Um, and I just, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love that. Yeah, and that was something that I had to be considerate of as well with that curved, you know, it's it it was an originally square island, you know, and I created that curve towards the end of it again to create that sense of community when hovering around again baking but baking as a community, people were coming over, they were cooking pasta, making it, cooking, you know, cookies and and so uh, I had to how to bring my attention and awareness to, to those needs. Yeah. Well, listen, I absolutely love it. Um, and I, I also love the time that we got to spend together today. Allison, I, I really, really appreciate it so much. Um, I love your work and I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Allison. Well done. Thank you, Walker Zanger and Thermosol for your continued support. And thank you for listening, subscribing, and downloading the show. And if you're not already, please do subscribe so you catch every episode of Lone Star House of Design and Convo by Design the moment they're published. You can also ask your smart speaker to play Convo by Design. And if you really want more, follow along. ConvoByDesign.com and at Convo by Design with an X on Instagram. For show inquiries, sponsorship, and guest inquiries, email me, convobydesign at outlook.com. Be well, and until next week, keep creating. Mm -hmm.